There you go. Good evening. My name is Kit Sheehan. I think we're online and I'm ready to go. Uh, I just wanted to read something. Uh, oh, I had my list of topics somewhere. Uh, maybe I don't. Uh, anyhow, uh, I guess now we can just move on to prayer here. Uh, somewhere I think I have uh, um, the prayer list. Um, You're not going to tell us about the squirrel. Oh, oh. <laughs> for those the, for those of you that don't have have the, the uh, uh, Facebook and are not one of my friends, um, uh, I've started a story, uh, and I just, it's funny and it makes my wife laugh. So I thought I'd share it. So I'm walking down the street. Uh, or I go for a walk in the afternoons uh, or mornings, usually in the morning in the park, um, uh, Monday through Friday. And I, I take a bag of, of peanuts and throw them out to the trees, and so the squirrels there get their, their, uh, get their uh, peanuts. But of course, all the animals, they, they, they know, uh, and they can recognize people. And I go out and feed the birds in my backyard, they, they know who I am. I just come out with a bag with my stuff to feed them, and, the, the blue jays are peanuts, peanuts, and you got the, the pigeons all start coming in um, uh, with other, for the other food. Well, I'm walking on the on the sidewalk in in a park, and all of a sudden, right in front of me, standing up, is this squirrel. I can't get by. There's it's standing right in front of me. Well, I, I guess he wants a wants a uh, wants a peanut. So I call, started call, calling him the, the extortionist uh, squirrel, and I gave him the name Vito. Uh, and somebody asked me if I, if uh, he had such and such a, uh, a relative, uh, also a, a, an Italian name, <laughs> and, and something. And uh, uh, so uh, not every day, because some days there's dogs or people or uh, they're mowing the, the grass. But I'll go out there, and there's Vito waiting for me. Uh, and uh, today I, I walked out there and he wasn't there. I said, oh, I, I'm, I'm home free. No, no, no protection money today. Mm -hmm. So I come, I come, I do three loops of the, of the, of the park. And so the third loop, uh, the, uh, the squirrel comes down and, and I'm thinking, uh oh, he's really mad now because I didn't leave it. I made him come down from the tree. <laughs> so I put down my little log there. So I had to pay him double. <laughs> so on my third trip, trip coming around, there he is again. Oh, he was so bad that he's going to he's going to it's going to cost me triple today. So people, I think people are beginning to like the, the my little story there. It, it's humorous, non political, and I've got pictures of the squirrel. Uh, uh, do I have? Um, uh, there's there's one of them. That's not a very good picture, but uh, uh, that's Vito. Um, and there's he's got got a got a peanut. So Mike and Betsy have a squirrel too. She has babies, and there they are. And they feed them peanuts. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. All right. So here's the. Everybody's got shift uh, to prayers we don't need to pr pray for Vito he's got plenty of food so. uh, oh this is uh, this is a, a new new format it looks like yeah um, so we got uh, uh, we start with the pastors uh, Judith and Herman uh, our, our normal prayers uh, they're navigating the uh, uh, um, the dangers of, of the COVID waters from day to day with uh, uh, and we all are to a certain extent um, and uh, we got uh, uh, John and Judy Hintz Tucson and uh, Jody and Kim Brown and Vice Fossil and Carrie um, and uh, we've got uh, the Risley family uh, they've got uh, uh, we've got the Fossil and, and Carrie and the Risley family are in foreign countries and in one they've got uh, a terrible anti-Christian uh, population, and the other they've got uh, drug dealers that don't think anything of killing somebody. Uh, so, um, they, well, we're all in the we're all in the in the battle. And uh, I think was it Phil or Chris? I can't remember on Sunday was saying the same thing. Chris, Chris yeah. 
uh, that, uh, uh, I don't know, this last year, I think uh, I've noticed a lot more, should I say, difficulties, uh, not just me, but other people as well. So um, uh, that's just what's the, the way it's happening, and, and God's got a plan, and we just got to trust, trust his grace and his provision, his plan, because he knows what he's doing, and I know I don't. Um, so I just got to trust him. Um, uh, I, I, I'm not going to go through the whole list here, but there's a uh, well, like Julie. Uh, we pray for her uh, uh, travel and uh, the retirement that she's trying to do. Um, and uh, um, computer issues. We, we ran across a couple of them tonight. Um, but we'll, we'll uh, navigate through that. Uh, I don't know if there's anything specific. Yes. He had a firm believer in prayer. It's like he'd be in prayer for our daughter. And Karen is just really fighting it. COVID. COVID. What's her name? Karen. 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 And Julie is too. She's not quite as bad as Karen. And uh, Samantha is. I have four girls that have it. Mm. And uh, Jay's had it, but he got over it like that. Yeah, okay. But okay. all the girls, Karen, Julie, Samantha, and Lola. Um, have it and that's bad stuff yeah yeah can't uh, and that it change it it affects different people differently some people don't hardly even know they have it other people die from it we had a, a policeman in Rockwell that was perfectly healthy he got it and died yeah. and and well who would who would have guessed I mean he was healthy uh, didn't appear to have any any uh, existing conditions that would have factored into that but um, just the way this virus works, it, it latches on to certain, uh, certain uh, um, the surface of certain kinds of cells. Uh, it's got a, like a, a key, and and so you find it goes through the, the the system, and it happens to latch on to the right place, and, and it releases the virus into that cell. That cell makes lots of copies of it. Well, now, my wife makes me drink this nasty stuff. What is it? Well, it's um, it's Thank natural. You. Hydroxychloroquine, oh. what it is, but it's it's made out of um, organic grapefruits, or, organic lemons. Boil it for ten minutes and then simmer it for three hours. Oh, and it's you know it's got good reviews on. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh. Oh. Not for me. Oh. <laughs> okay, well, there's lots of lots of different remedies. Uh, uh, any anything? Yeah, well. Uh, Depending upon who is for it and who is against it, uh, you got different people in the press saying, "Oh, we can't use that," but uh, um, if it works, it works. Um, uh, follow the science. Uh, uh, now, sometimes that people will throw that in our face. Follow the science. Well, whose science? Um, but if it's proven, uh, uh, like say some of this hydroxychloroquine has been out there for years for different reasons for malaria, uh, and if it works. Right, and there's other stuff as well, um, but sometimes trying to get information, correct information. Uh, one of those phrases that gets stuck in my mind is, uh, 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 when lies uh, meet reality, people get hurt. Uh, and we've seen a lot of that lately. Uh, so we need, we need fewer lies, but uh, uh, it seems to be that uh, people, especially in government, they like to lie because they don't, they're, they're Embarrassed, or that they, they don't want to get caught. Um, uh, so, uh, my wife and I watch uh, different shows uh, at night. Um, we ran out of shows on TV because they're, they're not making new ones very fast. So we've gone through uh, uh, Amazon and IMDb, and then uh, um, uh, what was the other one? There's another one, and then lately it's uh, uh, Tub. Tub TV, Tubs TV, something like that. That's free. And you just, just stream it online, and there's uh, shades of shades of blue uh, about this little group of, of police that are that are terribly corrupt, and everybody's lying to everybody else, so everybody's getting hurt. And 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 you, you almost don't want to watch because oh no, that guy's going to shoot so and so, and that guy's going to get killed, and <laughs> it's all because of lies. Every lot. Well, I don't know if you've seen uh, Chicago PD. Um, that, that that's a, on TV, yeah. Um, and certainly, there's a lot of lies there, uh, covering up. Uh, well, uh, 
the chief, or not the chief, but the, the guy, the sergeant or whoever it was in charge, uh, he murdered somebody, so they keep that uh, under wraps, and uh, it's just uh, lie after lie after lie, and uh, uh, it, yeah, I keep going back to Pontius Pilate, and ask Jesus, what is truth? Well, there we are, what is truth? Uh, well, here it is, right here. Nobody wants to listen to that, except the very few people. So, let's go into prayer before I start and use up the whole time talking about different things. Thank you, Father, for today. Thank you for our blessings. Um, thank you that we, we live in a country that still has some semblance of freedom and we are we have the opportunity to meet in freedom and uh, uh, learn, teach, uh, broadcast uh, truth from the Bible. Uh, we're grateful for our country. We please, Father, help it somehow. We know you have a plan um, and we have to trust you. Uh, pray that uh, you'll give me some words to uh, to make the tonight's lesson interesting um, and to uh, uh, to move forward um, and, and pray that the Holy Spirit will enlighten those that, that hear the message it's in Christ's name we pray amen now I think uh oh I thought I'd read from Josephus the, the story of Gideon so you can see from another perspective uh, what the, uh, uh, just like we did with, uh, was that with Ehud where we discovered, uh, where he actually said that uh, Ehud was a friend of Eglon. We, we suspected that from the text in the Bible, but as I said, the, te the text of the Bible doesn't always answer all our questions that we might have because he has a specific purpose and it uses the words that are there to, to, to advance that purpose but sometimes uh, inquiring minds uh, uh, need to know is that the commercial uh, and uh, uh, so uh, I've, I've always I, um, insatiable curiosity that's uh, that's I have insatiable curiosity there's no cure for it other than to just learn more and more and more uh, so okay let me let me go ahead and read this. You'll you'll notice there. You'll see there's things that uh, you recognize, but there'll be uh, portions that you say, "Well, he didn't even mention that." Uh, uh, so now, when Barak and Deborah were dead, whose deaths happened about the same time, afterwards the Midianites called the Amalekites and Arabians to their assistance and made war against the Israelites, and were too hard for those that fought against them. And when they had burnt the fruits of the earth, they they carried off the prey. Uh, and, and you'll notice this, uh, some of this uh, English is a little archaic. I think the word pray there, you could translate that booty or... Is or, that a different uh, page, Kit? Pardon? Are you reading from a different page? Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't, it was like three pages and I didn't want to put that in the, oh, on there, so I just okay. read it to you. Okay. Um, sorry, I should have said here, I've got, I've got the only copy here. <laughs> and that was long enough that I didn't want to put it in the, in the uh, thing. I'm just going to read it so you can hear it. Uh, now when they had done this for three years, the multitude of the Israelites retired to the mountains and forsook the plain country. Uh, and, and we've seen uh, throughout history that uh, when the Jews have problems, they go to the, the mountains. Uh, like uh, where do we get the Dead Sea Scrolls? In, from caves and mountains. Um, so, uh, that's, so this is nothing new. Well, I guess maybe it was new here. But uh, it, so you say Gideon, a lot of, there's a lot of things in Gideon that seem to have flowed uh, flow through the rest of Israel history. Uh, um, they also made themselves hollows underground and caverns and preserved therein whatsoever had escaped their enemies. For the Midianites made expeditions in harvest time, but permitted them, the Israelites, to plow the land in winters, that so when the others had taken the pains, they might have fruits for them to carry away. Indeed, there ensued a famine and scarcity of food, upon which they betook themselves to their supplications to God and besought him to save them. Gideon also, the son of Joash, and one of the principal persons of the tribe of Manasseh, uh, brought uh, his sheaves of corn privately and thrashed them at the wine press, for he was too fearful of their enemies to thrash them openly in the thrashing floor. At this time, somewhat of, someone appeared to him in the shape of a young man and told him that he was a happy man and beloved of God. 
He didn't call him the angel of the Lord, notice. Uh, to which he immediately replied, a mighty indication of God's favor to me that I am forced to use this wine press instead of a thrashing floor. But the parents exhorted him to be of good courage and to make an attempt for the recovery of their liberty. He answered that it was impossible for him to recover it because the tribe to which he belonged was by no means numerous and because he was but young himself and too inconsiderable to think of such great actions. But the other promised him that God would supply what he was defective in and would afford the Israelites victory over his conduct. Now, therefore, as Gideon was relating this to some young men, they believed him, and immediately there was an army of 10,000 men got ready for fighting. But God stood by Gideon in his sleep and told him that mankind uh, that, uh, were too fond of themselves and were enemies to such an ex as excelled in virtue. Now that they might not pass God over, but ascribe the victory to him, and might not fancy it obtained by their own power, because there were a great many and able of themselves to fight their enemies, but might confess that it was owing to his assistance, he advised him to bring his army about noon, in the violence of the heat, to the river, to esteem those that bent down on their knees, and so drank, to be men of courage. But all those who, that, that drank tumultuously, that he should have seen them to do it out of fear, and as in dread of their enemies. And when Gideon had done as God had suggested to him, there were found 300 men that took water with their hands tumultuously, I guess in fear. They didn't want courageous men, they wanted fe fearful guys that, uh, that would be easy to, to uh, encourage them for humility. Uh, so God bid him take these men and attack the enemy. Accordingly, they pitched their camp at the River Jordan as ready the next day to pass over it. But Gideon was in great fear, for God had told him beforehand that he should set upon his enemies in the night time. But God, being willing to free him from his fear, bid him take one of his soldiers and go near the Midianites' tents, for they should be from that very place, have his courage raised, and grow bold. So he obeyed, and went and took his servant Furah with him. And as he came near to one of the tents, he discovered that those that were in it were awake, and that one of them was telling his fellow soldier a dream of his own and that so plainly that Gideon could hear him. The dream was this. He thought he saw a barley cake, such as one could hardly be eaten by men. It was so vile, rolling through the camp and overthrowing the royal tent and the tents of all the soldiers. Now the old other soldier explained this vision to mean the destruction of the army and told them what this reason was, which made him so conjecture, that the seed called barley was, of, was all of it allowed to be of the vilest sort of seed and that the Israelites were known to be the vilest of all the people of Asia, agreeable to the seed of barley, and that what seemed to look big among the Israelites was this Gideon and the army that was with him. And since thou sayest that thou didst see the cake overturning our tents, I am afraid, lest God hath granted the victory over us to Gideon. When Gideon had heard this dream, good hope and courage came upon him, and he commanded his soldiers to arm themselves and told them of this vision of their enemies. They also took courage at what was told them, and was ready to perform what he should enjoin them. So Gideon divided his army into three parts, and brought it about the fourth watch of the night, each part containing a hundred men. They all bear empty pitchers and lighted lamps in their hands, that their onset might not be discovered by their enemies. They had also each of them a ram's horn in his right hand, which he used instead of a trumpet. The enemy's camp took up a large space of ground, for it happened that they had a great many camels, and as they were divided into different nations, so they all contained in, were all contained in one circle. Now, when the Hebrews did as they were ordered beforehand, upon their approach to their enemies, and on the signal given, sounded their ram with the ram horns, and break their pitchers, and set upon their enemies with their lamps and a great shout and cry, Victory to Gideon by God's assistance. That's a little different than what the Bible said, but okay. A disorder and a fright seized upon the other men while they were half asleep, for it was night time as God would have it, so that a few of them were slain by their enemies, but the greatest part of their own soldiers on account of their diversity of their language. And when they were once put into disorder, they killed all that they met with, as thinking them to be enemies also. Thus there was a great slaughter made, and as the report of Gideon's victory came to the Israelites, they took their weapons and pursued their enemies, and overtook them in a certain valley encompassed with torrents, a place which these could not get over, so they encompassed them and slew them all with their kings, Oreb and Zeb. But the remaining captains let those soldiers that were left, which were about 18,000, and pitched their camp a great way off the Israelites. However, Gideon did not grudge his pains, but pursued them with all his army, and, and joining 
battle with them, cut off the whole arm, enemy's army, and took their, the other leaders, Ziba and Zalmunna, and made them captives. Uh, now, there's no mention of, of Ephraim here, uh, it just says Gideon did it. Uh, now, they were slain in, the, in this battle of the Midianites and of their auxiliaries, the Arabians, about 120,000. And the Hebrews took great prey, booty, gold, silver, garments, camels, and asses. And when Gideon came to his own country of Ophrah, he slew the kings of the Midianites. Oh, here we are. However, the tribe of Ephraim was so displeased at the good success of Gideon that they resolved to make war against him, accusing him because he did not tell them of his expedition against their enemies. But Gideon, a man of temper, and that excelled in every virtue, pleaded that it was not the result of his own authority or reasoning that made him attack the enemy without them, but it was a command of God, and still the victory belonged to them as well as those in the army. And by this method of cooling their passions, he brought more advantage to the Hebrews than by the success he had against his enemies, for, they, for he thereby delivered them from a sedition which was arising among them. Yet did this tribe afterwards suffer the punishment of this injurious treatment of Gideon, of which we will give an account in due time. Hereupon Gideon would have laid down the government, but was overpersuaded to take it, which he enjoyed forty years, and distributed justice to them as the people came to him in their differences, and what he determined was esteemed valid by all. And when he died, he was buried in his own country of Ophir. Uh, gives a slightly different perspective. Um, uh, and, and, um, Sounds like the, Hollywood. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, certainly Josephus probably had his own, own uh, perspective, his own uh, prejudices. As ob obviously you see the, um, uh, the, 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 uh, the participation of Ephraim was, was not described the same way in the, as it is in the Bible. Was so, he Jewish? Yes, yes, he was Jewish, um, and I forget the, the story. The history of the Jews. Pardon? He wrote the history of. The Jews. Yeah, the antiquities of, of the. Uh, yeah, but the way. He... Yes, but he was yes he was Jewish, and and he wrote some of his stuff because uh, the challenge I guess against the Jews and that he wanted to have the history down on. Uh, now it's obvious that he followed a lot of what was in the Bible, so we we suspect that uh, or some people suspect that he may have had uh, scrolls from the from the temple in order to guide him. Uh, so he was definitely a secular. Yes, a secular Jew. He was a general in, uh, uh, I forget who the, the emperor was at the time, but uh, he was, uh, um, do, do we need to, to, to warm it up a little bit for you? No, it's fine. Oh, okay. I may get hot in a minute. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I, I, I understand that. And, and I do too, because uh, every night at nine o'clock, I got to turn the air conditioner on. <laughs> And so I, plus or minus 10 minutes, 9 o'clock. <laughs> so, uh, I think uh, it's just, Ken, I think it's just good to see it from his perspective. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah well, that, that, that was the point is that sometimes you see things a little differently, and, and, uh, he's, he's, uh, 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 the Bible is in the errant word of God, so we know that that's true. Um, and so he may not, there are other things that he may have not, um, uh, uh, not have understood correctly, um, but it gives us a, a different view, and in some cases gives us a, some perspective, uh, and maybe answer some questions that we had about the Bible. Like I said, Ehud, and it specifically Josephus specifically says that he was a friend of Eglon, and when you suspect that from the, the, the way the Bible is written, but it just doesn't say that specifically. So. Uh, um, Oh, let me go ahead and start here with my, my page one. Now, that was actually the first paragraph, but that was a little longer than a regular paragraph, obviously. So after the light show, the pictures and, uh, pictures and torches and sound, shofars, uh, the Midianites killed many of their allies and then fled. Then select tribes of Israel pursued them. And I'm, gonna, I'm overlapping what we did last week just to give us a little continuity. And sometimes I add, as I uh, making that continuity, I add a few things. So some of this is, is new stuff, some of it's old. Uh, Judges seven twenty three, and the men of Israel were summoned from Naphtali, Asher, and all Manasseh, and they pursued Midian. Assuming these were the same troops that Gideon originally called, then Judges seven three through seven seven, there were thirty two thousand men. Uh, they pursued the fleeing Midianites. It can also be assumed that when the Midianites showed up, that many were killed by the men of these tribes. They likely did some battlefield looting, the, Is the Israelites, and plundering. And, and it's, it says so in, in, in Josephus. So there's a question. Of, and, and later on, there's one, one verse that indicates that also in the Bible. 
that uh, that uh, and that's just the way things were in that culture. Uh, you, you conquer an enemy and you kill him. Well, I'm, I'm not going to leave his money on the field over there. That's good money. Or and apparently, what what I what uh, um, I noticed is that clothing was important. Uh, now, clothing in those those days was probably made a lot better than clothing is made today. Um, and uh, so that uh, some of the stuff that you see where they they got the, the, the money and this and the clothing, uh, I think we'll see that in Samson where there's a was it 32 changes of clothing, um, and or or when Jesus is getting crucified, they they uh, um, uh, uh, the drew guards lots for yeah, drew lots for the clothing. So so there's something there with and it's, some of the stuff that we read is not in our culture. So we sometimes. Okay, we'll take note of that, uh, but uh, um, we don't understand it from their perspective of how important that clothing was. Maybe the clothing was, I mean, it was tailored, I guess. I mean, you didn't have machines to make it, well, so so it was probably more expensive in that respect. It, it had to be made. They had to weave or yeah. do something to make the material. Yeah, yeah, and then cut it and weave it, or in some cases, if they just had uh, uh, certain kinds of clothing or, or uh, they weave it in a... It, make it one piece of material, but that you put it on you. Um, so that took a lot of effort. So, um, so go to Goodwill. Yeah. They, they likely did some battlefield looting and plundering. Um, it is also likely that the fleeing Midianites had better swords and other weapons of use to the sons of Israel. Uh, they may have had some armor and money. A small, competent force can overwhelm a larger force that's in panic. And uh, sometimes when I when I read something, oh, I saw I saw something just like that in a movie. And so, and the movie, I don't know. That, that's our that's our culture. And so I can relate sometimes to things said in a movie if it's if it's uh, if it's uh, correct. And one of the things I don't know, I like science fiction movies. That's just that's just me. I grew up liking science and animals and machines and stuff so but there's a in the one of the dune uh like uh, series of movies and books uh, someone in there says i must not fear fear is the mind killer fear is the little death that brings total obliteration so i, I agree with the that that fear is something that you want to avoid because it is a, yes it kind of sounds like winston churchill oh <laughs> Nothing to fear, but fear itself. So, uh, uh, so the Christian solution to fear is to trust the power of God, the Holy Spirit, and God, the Father's plan. We have numbers of promises that tell us not to fear. Um, and I, I think I already mentioned this uh, concerning the battlefield plundering. <clears throat> Josephus says there were slain in, in this battle of the Midianites. Uh, and their auxiliaries, the Arabians, about 120,000. And Hebrews took a great prey, booty, gold, silver, garments, camels, and asses. So that uh, there's their plunder. Uh, Judges 7, 24, and 25. Then Gideon sent messengers throughout the hill country of Ephraim, saying, Come down against Midian and take control of the waters ahead of them, as far as Beth Barah in the Jordan. So all the men of Ephraim were summoned, and they took control of the waters as far as Beth Barah in the Jordan. And they captured the two leaders of, of Midian, uh, Oreb and Zeb, and they killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb, and they killed Zeb at the winepress of Zeb while they pursued Midian. And they brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon from across the Jordan. We talked about that uh, last week, and uh, that uh, sometimes people in the Old Testament uh, to verify to somebody else that, yeah, I really killed him, and here's his head. <laughs> um, but the, Or hands are, are other things that uh, um, are identifiable. Um, the number of men from the tribe of Ephraim that responded to the call of, to arms is not given. Uh, the military commanders were captured and beheaded. When, and, uh, Judges 8 and 1. Then the men of Ephraim said to Gideon, What is this thing that you have done to us, not calling us upon us when you went uh, to fight against Midian? And they quarreled with him vehemently. But he said to them, What have I done now in comparison with you? Is the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim not better than the vintage of Ephraim? Abizer. God has handed over to you the leaders of Midian, Oreb, and Zeb. And what was I able to do in comparison with you? Then in their anger toward him subsided when he said that. And we got a different perspective on that from Josephus. That uh, when uh, they were angry, that uh, it was like they were going to revolt. 
So as that, and, and that kind of amplifies what's said in the Bible. But uh, Josephus doesn't mention that it was Ephraim that got these guys and, and, and uh, um, uh, Oreb and, and Zeb. So we dealt with some of that uh, last week. And uh, what I, I think most of you, I think I, I printed this out in color this time. Uh, so you've actually got a color map instead of just black and white. Uh, and that, that was kind of important for this map so you can see all the different colors of, this is Gideon's battle. I got this from BibleStudy.org. Um, so you can see um, around uh, Herod's Well, Oprah, Mount Tabor, uh, Mount Gilboa, that was where we started out, and then we end up, uh, we'll end up tonight in uh, Sukkoth and uh, Penuel, uh, down on the uh, right side across the Jordan. Uh, Judges 8.4, Then Gideon and the 300 men who were with him came to the Jordan and crossed over, exhausted, yet still pursuing. The, tre the, the retreating Midianites were terrified, adrenaline, adrenaline kicking in, causing them to flee rapidly. The 300 are trying to keep up without the adrenaline rush. They probably have more than the normal backpack of supplies because they've, they've looted. Uh, they went on a looting spree, uh, probably chasing uh, uh, someone. Uh, hey, Jacob, come on, come on. Well, I got to just pick up this, this last cloth here and I got the gold, this money. I got to hurry up, hurry up. We're chasing the. So, so, so then they put all that stuff. You can see that uh, in a movie. You know, all the guys and the guys you know, lopping along, trying to keep up. And so he's going for miles like that, and and and, and, they're, and eventually he's, he's dead tired, and he's hungry. They ran out of their supplies. Didn't they have much sleep? Little to eat. Ran out of water. Uh, and uh, uh, remember in in chapter seven that we talked about the citizens uh, provisions uh, chapter Judges 7 8 uh, I've got there in the middle of chapter, uh, page 5 so the 300 men took the people's provisions and I call that the citizens provided provisions and then trumpets in their hands now the logical assumption is that the citizens of Israel even if from another tribe will supply provisions to rid themselves of the Midianites not <laughs> that's what happened here and you say what 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 and Judges 8, 5. And he said to the men of Sukkoth, Please give loaves of bread to the people who are following me, for they are exhausted. And I am pursuing Ziba and Zalumna, Zalmuna, the kings of Midian. As I just said, the citizens of Israel provided provisions for the 300. Now tribes that were on the other side of the Jordan refused to provide bread to the Israelite army. I refer to sons of Israel who work against Israel, deny Israel as wicked sons. As based on the book by uh, David Mamet, The Wicked Son. And I've, I've talked about that previously another other time. The citizens of Sukkoth and Penuel are wicked sons. Based upon the previous map, Sukkoth and Penuel are located in the territory of the tribe of Gad. But Gideon does not identify them as from the tribe of Gad. They're just from those cities and subservient to whoever's in charge. In their minds, until the king's opinion had been completely defeated, in other words, killed, they would not go against them, even though their own tribal families were in danger. The wicked sons. Also note that the scenario is similar to what happened under Barak. There, Sisera, the commander of the enemy forces, is killed first. Then the king, Jabin, is killed. Here in Judges chapter 7 and 8, the commanders of the armies, Oreb and Zeb, are killed. Then Zeb and Zal Zalmunna, kings of Midian, will be killed. The same kind of scenario. We saw something similar under under Ehud, where he killed uh, Eglon, and then they went after the the, uh, the military forces. There is an interesting flow of events. God provided a prophet to warn the sons of Israel. No one listened. The angel of the Lord came to Gideon. Very slowly, with great doubt, Gideon finally believes. Then Gideon is energized by the Holy Spirit. Gideon takes command of the farmer's army of Israel, even 300 chosen by God. Gideon and the 300 in their pursuit of the kings of Midian run out of provisions and need to eat. Yet the wicked sons who are aligned with the enemy refuse to provide bread for their brother tribesmen. And based upon based upon uh, reading Zephaniah, the same kind of thing will happen in the millennium, or in the tribulation, that you'll have Jews against Jews. Um, and I happen to remember something uh, when I was taking Arabic language classes a long time ago. That I, I there was when you when you go to class six hours a day for uh, years a year uh, the the teachers will will stray off into to, to different uh, stories just like I do uh, and 
And uh, so one of those is, is an old Bedouin saying, and I've got this from a book, uh, and I haven't read that book, but I like the saying. There's an old Arab Bedouin saying, I against my brothers, I and my brothers against my cousins. I and my brothers and my cousins against the world. And then the lady that's writing the story says, that is jungle law. It is the way of the world when the world is thrown into chaos. It is our job to avert that chaos, to fight against it, to resist the urge to become savage. Because the problem with such law is that if you follow it, you're always fighting against someone. And that's from that book, The Sweetness of Tears, and I can't, I can't uh, recommend it or not recommend it because I haven't read it yet. But uh, certainly I, I like that. that. That was a source for that, that uh, quote. Um, and now, I also happened to, to, to watch uh, Lawrence of Arabia this past week. It was on TV, and I'd seen that years before. Uh, I, it was, I yeah, really enjoyed it. Uh, uh, but it reminded me, of, again, of that, that tribal culture of one, one tribe against another one. Um, and also of uh, blood feud and a lot of other things that, that, are, that are against or different from our culture that we don't just... Uh, we, we don't understand, but there it is. That's, that's their culture from that time. Now we come across two place names. I wasn't going to mention them, but as I got into them, I started finding it was interesting, so I put it down. So you have one of the, the place names, Sukkoth, and from the uh, internet, the, the Bible Atlas. Well, maybe I misspelled that. Uh, but, uh, and sometimes I find... Uh, that I'm typing and typing and typing, and uh, the spelling correct throws in. I didn't. Well, I didn't put that word in there. Yeah. Well, how come it's in your did your text? <laughs> the computer did that. Well, sometimes it's true. I had a had a had a teacher, uh, uh, um, a math teacher in college, and he's writing stuff on the on the board, and somebody says, "Well, that's not right." Oh, that's a typographical <laughs> error. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, uh, after, so here, here's, uh, here's our quote. After parting with Esau, Jacob journeyed to Sukkoth, a name which he gave to the place from the booths which he erected to shelter his cattle in Genesis 33. It was in the territory of Gad and is mentioned with uh, Beth Nimrah. In, in his pursuit of Ziba and Zalmun Zalmuna, Gideon seems to have retraced the path followed by Jacob, passing Sukkoth before Penuel. Their churliness uh, on that occasion brought dire punishment upon the men of Sukkoth. Gideon, on his return, taught them with thorns and briars. Now, Bruce Watke translates that word uh, uh, shelter, uh, the booths, um, but certainly it was a shelter for the, for the animals there. And, and there's a word in there that uh, they translate as please, and uh, uh, I thought that was interesting um, uh, that. Uh, um, Gideon, when he's talking to the, Lord, the the angel of the Lord, uses that word four times. Um, so it's a it's a what did I put there? Obviously, it's a polite word, and Jesenia says it is used in a submissive and modest request. So he's so when he makes the request of the men of Sukkoth, he's he's being polite, and and uh, they're not so polite in their reply. Uh, following me. So again, I like the, the Hebrew there all. They, they use parts of the body for different uh, uh, words or concepts. And here, uh, following me is in my feet. Uh, uh, the loaf, this, this word for loaves is different than the one that we used in the Midianite stream. This is a more common word for loaf than the one that was previously used. And then bread, that's the same, uh, the same word used in, uh, in the Midianite stream. Ziba and Zalmuna. Uh, for Thomas Constable, Gideon routed the remnant of the Midianite allowance and captured the two kings of Midian, Ziba, victim, and <coughs> Zalmuna, protection refused. Their names, like that of Kushan Rishathayim earlier, may have been nicknames that the Israelites and or the writer gave them. So we've, we've seen that things that, that we might take for names of people are, may actually be nicknames in the Bible. Uh, and... Uh, so often the nicknames are easier to remember. Uh, I remember seeing a show on TV, The Butcher of Buchenwald, uh, uh, in, the, in the, the Jewish uh, uh, the camps in the Holocaust. I don't know what his name is, but I can certainly remember Butcher of Buchenwald. So the same thing with Ziba and Zalmuna, that uh, their real names may have been 
a little difficult to uh, to remember, but uh, certainly uh, their nicknames are, are, are easier. And I've got the little map there that shows has an arrow towards the the, the place of uh, the tribe of Gad. Judges 8, 6. But the leaders of Sukkot said, Are the hands of Z Ziba and Zalmunna already in your hand that we should give you bread to, to your army? The human viewpoint of, uh, from the wicked son. They, they refused to re recognize the familial ties to Israel. Um, leaders. This is the same word used of the Midianite military commanders, or of Zeb. They were put to death for what they did to Israel. Now the leaders of Sukkot refused to help Gideon. 8.7. On page 9. So Gideon said, For this answer, when the Lord, Yahweh, has handed over to me Ziba and Salmuna, I will thrash your bodies with the thorns of the wilderness and there with briars. Uh, when the, uh, uh, when, Gideon uses the name of God, the God of the covenants, Yahweh, to remind the inhabitants of Sukkoth that they are under the covenant just as Gideon is. Yet they have forgotten their Lord God and have, have allegiance to the Midianites. Then you have a couple of interesting words. Um, it can uh, thrash. It can be used of threshing, like an ox pulling a plow, creating furrows in the dirt. So with the with the, the briars, I guess he's going to scratch them until there's burrows in their skin. Maybe. Here's an entry from the Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament. As an expression for cruel military acts, Judges eight, seven, and sixteen certainly has in mind cruel military acts. Although these verses do not specify in detail how Gideon punished the elders of Sukkoth, it is clear that they did not actually use threshing with discs. We will have to be content to, to say with Myers what threshing with thorns and briars meant, we do not know, but we can imagine that it meant death by torture. Now, it, the Bible doesn't say he killed that they killed them, but it doesn't rule that out, I guess. Thorns, the word means thorns. Here it's used as instruments of corporal punishment, according to the Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament. I suspect there's a play on on this word. There's another aspect of thorns in the in the in the dictionary. The noun kos is used metaphorically for hostile alien peoples and what befalls them. So we have here uh, the wicked son who's uh, acting like an alien, hostile uh, to Israel, uh, will will receive this, this punishment. Isaiah 33:12 compares the fate of the peoples to thorns that are cut down and burned in a fire. Destroyed because they are of no value. Um, Briars, Jesenius and Young's literal translation suggests this was actually threshing instruments. Um, and so there's apparently a play on words between uh, the thorns and briars and thrash uh, with plowing. So he's going to plow furrows in their bodies apparently with uh, thorns. Um, Judges 8.8, 8. then he went up from there to Penuel and spoke similarly to them. And the men of Penuel answered him just as the men of Sukkoth had answered. So he said also to the men of Penuel, when I return safely, I will tear down this tower. This, uh, I, I, I mentioned that, I won't go through it, I don't have a lot of time. But I mentioned uh, Caesar when he was captured by uh, Cilician pirates, that uh, he joked around with them because he was under ransom. Uh, and, and they were asking for 20, uh, um, pieces of gold or silver or something. And he's, well, no, no, don't ask for 20, ask for 50. So and he's joking and they're, wow, this guy's, uh, well, why, well, why would he increase the price? This guy is stupid. So then he's joking around, uh, I think theme was like saying like, well, he's like playing cards with him and having fun and drinking with him. And so then he gets the, gets the, uh, uh, the ransom and then he leaves. And then he gathers a bunch of boats together, goes back and, uh, and just and he told them before he left, I'm going to hang you from the. And they all laugh, thinking, Yeah, right. And so he comes back and he does it. He he, he crucifies them. Um, so, uh, but uh, so here's here's uh, Gideon says, I'm going to I'm going to mess you up when I come back. And sure enough, he does. Penuel, a, a place name, again from the Bible Atlas. Uh, this time I think I spelled it correctly. Peniel, face of God. This is the form of the name in Genesis 32, 30. In the next verse and elsewhere, it appears as Penuel. The name is said to have been given to the place by Jacob after his night of wrestling by Jabbok, uh, because as he said, I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. It was a height evidently close to the stream by, over which Jacob passed in the morning. 
Some have thought it might be a prominent cliff, the contour of which resembled a human face. Such a cliff on the seashore to the south of Tripoli was called uh, Theoprosopon, face of God. In later times, the city with strong towers stood upon it. This lay in the line of Gideon's pursuit of the Midianites. When he returned victorious, he beat down the place because of the churlishness of the inhabitants. Are these two place names reminders of God's provision to Jacob? Uh, or, or, uh, uh, in other words, a reminder to Gideon about what happened with, with uh, Jacob. Jacob was his ancestor. Uh, <clears throat> and here he is going to these two places. Um, and uh, uh, didn't Gideon see the Lord face to face just like Jacob? Uh, in Genesis 32 and 30. So Jacob named the place Peniel, for he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been spared. And then Gideon, in Judges 6.22, when Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord, he said, O Lord God, for I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face, just like uh, Jacob. And there he goes to the place Peniel, face to face. It's interesting. And then when Gideon travels to Sukkoth, <clears throat> uh, Genesis 33.17 for Jacob, but Jacob journeyed to Sukkoth and built for himself a house and made booths for his livestock, and therefore the place is named Sukkoth. And then Judges 6.24, here's the Young's literal translation, um, and Gideon buildeth there an altar to Jehovah and calls Jehovah Shalom. Unto this day is yet an obra of the Abbey Israelites. And there may be a, a tie to the feast of the booths, but there, there may be that, a little difficult uh, to, to try and present that here. Sukkoth being uh, uh, booths. Tear down. From the Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament, <coughs> the primary meaning characterizes the use of the, the Hebrew word nuts is break up, demolish, tear down, an edifice or some construction. The verb refers to the violent tearing down of houses, towers, walls, entire cities, as well as altars, sanctuaries, and high places and other cultic institutions. Apart from a few examples of metaphorical use, this word refers consistently to the destruction of edifices or objects constructed by human hands. The concrete notion of tearing down is so strong that the more general meaning of destroy is wholly inappropriate. The verb is used in chapter 6 of Gideon, the hewer, when he tore down the stronghold of Baal. Now he threatens to tear down the tower or safe place of the people of Penuel. They have turned from the Lord and are trusting in man. Take note of two Bible verses in this respect. Jeremiah 17, 5. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength and whose heart turns away from the Lord. In Psalm 8, 118, 8. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in people. So you know, the, the people were trusting in their tower and uh, Gideon comes back and destroys the tower. Uh, these verses, verses were written after the time of Gideon, but they express a thought that Gideon may have had. Certainly, he was involved in an illustration of those kinds of, of thoughts. Uh, this tower, uh, the dictionary uh, of, of the Old Testament uh, on the word tower. In the older text, Migdal refers to a fortified citadel inside the city itself, offering a final place of refuge. In other words, it provides security, or at least a sense of security. This, wor this word will be used several times in the next chapter. Once again, we're given a reference to something with little explanation. This tower refers to a specific tower, which up to this point has not been identified. There was apparently a single place of refuge within the city, a single tower. And apparently, I'm reading other places, that uh, when people uh, were afraid of something on the outside, they'd run, run to the tower and, and hide inside. Any questions? Let me close in prayer. Thank you, Father, for today. Thank you for helping me put this together and, and speak words. Please uh, uh, empower people with the Holy Spirit that they might understand and be able to apply the, the thoughts in your word. Uh, we again pray for our, our country, Father, um, that people will look to you for solutions. But we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.